What needs do we have? How do we address them? How can we transcend them? These are questions psychologist Abraham Maslow asked, and I ask, and you ask, and let's ask them together. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. In 1943, American psychologist Abraham Maslow wrote a paper where he talked about uh, motivations, what motivates humans. And so the idea was that we have basic needs uh, that we have to meet before we can meet other needs. So the most basic are uh, the need to survive, their physiological needs. So that'd be food and water uh, and, and uh, having shelter. And then um, there's needs for security, for safety. And then there's needs uh, for social uh, acceptance, uh, belonging, uh, being part of a family, having friends. And then there's needs for self-esteem, that you feel all right about yourself. And then there are needs, uh, he said, uh, where you actually do more, where you... Um, want to do something with your life, realize yourself, uh, achieve your potential. And so that's called self-actualization or self-realization. So those were five needs, and uh, they're drawn here as a pyramid uh, to reflect that um, you start with the bottom, and then when you can build on that, then you can turn to other needs, and then they can support other needs, and then you can proceed in this way. Uh, and I think we know from practical life that there are um, vivid examples where people don't address more basic needs because they uh, pursue more lofty needs. You know, you hear of starving artists, so to speak, although it's difficult to uh, paint if you're starving, but uh, certainly people are making choices but what we do know, for example, is that people give up their lives or risk their lives um, to help other people in, in different ways. So uh, those are very uh, dramatic examples. But what Maslow said um, in his uh, papers available online in archive.org, uh, and you can find it through Wikipedia, but um, he says that, well, but there'll be a certain need, let's say, that dominates under certain circumstances. And th this whole approach was quite radical at the time uh, because uh, he was giving an alternative to behavioralism, which basically said that, well, we can't really know anything about humans, uh, what's going on in their mind, because it's maybe just all invented. Uh, but we can think of humans as rats. So we can have rats go through mazes, for example. We can give rats uh, rewards. Um, and similarly, we can look at humans, how are they behaving, and just infer from their behavior, but not try to mentalize it. So that was one a very dominant approach in his time, uh, you know, like in the study of advertisement, let's say things like that, like what is, what is the behavioral change? Um, another uh, that he was giving an alternative to was Freud and psychotherapy, the idea that there are some kind of mystic, mysterious drives in people, uh, that we can't really maybe fathom, but that they're operating, we can maybe infer. And so he's saying, no, I don't want to invent some kind of drives, and I don't want to study humans by studying animals. I want to look at humans in a common sense way. And I want to look, uh, let's say, how they act or how they respond or deal with circumstances. And so that's a very a level-headed uh, model that he came up with. Now, what happened then was that, well, there could be variants of that, you see. Uh, so one of the advantages of this is that it can be possibly tested uh, using experimental psychology. Uh, even simple things like just surveying people, asking about their needs, uh, encoding them and seeing, well, what are the needs? You know, have we overlooked some? Uh, so, and of course, you can maybe philosophically uh, do an analysis, like, are we repeating something? So, um, we can try to come up with different tools. And so, people ended up saying, well, maybe there's more needs. So, uh, in the right-hand side, you see this 
pyramid uh, with uh, aesthetic needs, cognitive needs, maybe transcendence, right? And this becomes very debatable. So I learned about uh, Maslow's hierarchy through my brother Jonas. He was uh, in art school at the time. I believe this was in 1986. I had started grad school at uh, UCSD in mathematics uh, because I thought math would be relevant uh, for uh, philosophical language, you know, in this quest to know everything and apply that usefully. And he said, oh, you know, you should, you should take a look at this. I hadn't heard of it. And the version he had uh, is pretty much the version I show here with six levels. So uh, I would look at that and I would say, well, how do we know? Why are there six levels? But I didn't have the resources or maybe even the interest to do some huge psychological experiment. I just looked logically, metaphysically, like internally, conceptually, like, is there some structure here? And so I looked at it and I said, well, I see this kind of two times three structure. You can see that in this version, opportunity or freedom or liberty, that's added as a fifth one. So, and uh, just in these pictures, uh, I'm numbering them typically from the top going down or from the left going right. So survival is first, security, social, self-esteem, opportunity, self-fulfillment. And what I noticed was that the first three, I thought, have to do with needs of the body and the second three with needs of the psyche. And I said, well, survival is of the body, what we maybe have to deal with right now. But self-esteem is like survival of the psyche. Okay, if you have no self-esteem, it's like you don't exist. You, know, you need to have some limited self-esteem in order to be able to function psychologically. So uh, take care of yourself, let's say. Now, security, I thought, well, that's so that I could survive not just today, but also tomorrow. I would feel safe. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not as immediate as survival, but it's looking ahead, saying, well, I, I need to worry about survival tomorrow, okay? And so opportunity is analogous. It's saying, well, I need, maybe I have some self-esteem, but I need self-esteem tomorrow too, okay? So you want freedom. You want to be able to maneuver. And then social is to be able to say, okay, well, what's the whole point of surviving and having security? It's, it's to be part of this family, community, humanity, or more. And so this culmination, it's social, you know, so that everybody could survive, everybody could be secure. And so similarly, like, well, what's the whole point of self-esteem and opportunity? What's, what comes of all that? That may also be so... Um, you know, social or might be even universal, you know, so, but the point being that it's self-fulfillment. So I thought, okay, two times three, that's a structure. Metaphysically, it suggests that this is something to um, take seriously uh, because it's a complete set, okay? And you can see the issues to consider that uh, this distinction between body and psyche and these three levels. And so that's where it was in 1986. And then some years later, I was uh, living with my grandmother, a uh, wonderful um, woman, Maria Kapatsinskas, um, in uh, Chicago, in the Market Park neighborhood. And uh, this was after my PhD. I think this was about 1994. And so then I, it dawned on me, maybe I saw something like that in terms of one of these. But basically what I noticed was that, oh, there's a connection between our needs and the operating principles we uh, use to address them. Now, it's not like that these operating principles actually provide for the needs, but it's really more almost the opposite, I think. Like the operating principles reflect what needs we're responding to. It's just the mode that we go into, okay? So in first, uh, they may sound a little bit, maybe even debatable, but I think you'll at least get a picture of uh, where I'm going with this, uh, what it reveals about us. So maybe give me a little bit of latitude here. 
But so the idea is that when people, maybe maybe the one just to say, I think maybe where it came from was like, when people want, you know, when people are hoarding or getting more than what they need, that could be a sign of insecurity, you know, or dealing with this need for security. I suspect, uh, you know, so that's maybe understandable, but I suspect that I heard that somewhere and then I go, oh, oh, oh. Well, what would be the operating principles for all these other needs? So I said, well, for survival, I and I imagine these, but I kind of, I like this system. Uh, uh, so <laughs> we'll see where it goes. But I said, so for, for survival, you cling to what you have. Okay, and maybe the image is, you know, if you're, you see in the movies where someone is, going to fall off a bridge, but they're clinging and they're holding and they're hanging on and they're waiting to be rescued or or helped. So they're clinging to the hand that's holding them. Um, now, for survival, you know, really, I guess people say, well, there's fight or flight, you know, so sometimes you fight and sometimes you run. But the idea here is that um, whether you're fighting or fleeing or whatever, but you're holding on to your life. You know, there's expression like that, right? Like you're you're persisting, you know, you're identifying with yourself, first of all, you don't walk away from yourself. So you run with yourself, <laughs> and you take yourself out of there, but you're clinging. So whether you're moving yourself out of there, or whether you're defending yourself, but it's about you being you continuing to be you and what you have to do to be you. Okay. So that's, uh, or like if I'm, you know, if you're following uh, elections somewhere in the world, and you see, wow, those people are loyal to their candidate, right? Uh, they're just clinging to that candidate, despite maybe all kinds of other reasons or, or logics or whatever. They're clinging to that. So then I think, well, that's because for them, it's registering as survival. The survival of, let's say, their identity, basically. Maybe their physical identity. I mean, but on the physical level, visceral level, that's what they're experiencing. And then for the social need... Well, it's about avoiding extremes. Now, you know, Aristotle talked about avoiding extremes, Confucius, and they were quite social philosophers, right? It was basically be normal, right? Um, but the logic is that, well, once you're clinging to what you have and you've even got more than what you need, you see, if you get more than what you need, then you have something to lose that you could let go and you still have what you must have, right? So getting more than what you need is kind of a way of just having... To uh, giving you that buffer where you can lose if if necessary, um, but you won't uh, lose the key thing directly. Now, avoiding extremes is about helping other people address their need for survival, and while well, they're trying to cling to what they have, so just don't rock the boat, right? Don't do things that would um, keep people from surviving. So, and you can imagine if you're in a a well, very difficult environment like Gaza or Ukraine, uh, you probably want to be normal uh, because uh, if you can't add to the normality, someone will whack you with a stick or something just to kind of get in line, right? Because like, don't cause, we have enough problems as it is, right? I, I don't want to abuse the imagination, but, but I think I've made the point. So, now, the point with the psyche is that everything works almost the opposite way. Um, with self-esteem, our self-esteem goes up when we choose the good over the bad. So, like, that car is good. Uh, this person is beautiful. Uh, that country is horrible. But every time I make a decision, it boosts me. Like, well, who am I? I must be somebody if I'm making all these decisions, right? So the psyche feels like it's doing its job, right? So that's what we're, um, that's what boosts our self-esteem. That's the, th that's, I just made this up, but I think I like it. I think it's reflective of, see, and then what you can say is that, well, then what's the need for freedom about or opportunity? It's so you could have self-esteem tomorrow. So you want to be able to, you need to choose the better over the worse so that tomorrow you could choose the good over the bad. And so when you choose the better over the worse, they Options might both be bad, or they might be both be good, but it doesn't matter. You're going to choose the better one because that's going to give you more freedom or more maneuverability uh, or more power so that you could choose the good over the bad, right? And so uh, that leads to compromises. You know, you're choosing the better over the worse. So you're, for the sake of freedom, you compromise. 
for managing freedom is about managing compromise. Now, what about helping other people have self-esteem so they could choose the good over the bad? Well, then you would be as extreme as possible. So you're choosing the best over the rest. And if you're extreme, it makes them easier uh, for them to choose, right? They can like you, they don't like you, but either way, you're boosting their self-esteem, okay? So those are the six operating principles. But that's all quite mechanical, you know? So um, that just makes us out like machines. In a certain sense, uh, of course, we look like machines in the real world, and we're. this is explaining how we function as machines. But... Um, and this, this comes from studying uh, scripture also, which kind of like opens up the mind. Uh, if you can figure this out on your own, you must be very holy. But there's two other operating principles. So the one is, um, you know, how do you walk away from your needs? How do you ignore your needs or not worry about your needs? I mean, uh, that's what we focus on. But you can ignore your own needs by taking up the needs of another. Okay, so if you get, if someone else needs help, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have helped other people and you're you're willing to help other people and you get immersed in that and you will forget about yourself. You know, there's people who work every day in jobs where they just completely forget about themselves and their interests. They're serving others. Okay, and that's fantastic. And that's very special. Uh, and that's just of a different character. That's not addressing a need. That's ignoring your own needs and getting untangled out of your own needs and freeing yourself of your own needs by embracing another person's needs. And then um, you don't have to have needs necessarily. You could be perfect, right? So like when my grandmother, uh, Maria Kapitsinskas, would uh, have done her work in the morning and she would, uh, at home, she was retired, but she would kick up her feet uh, for her circulation, and she would watch uh, TV. She watched opera, which is how she pronounced Oprah. So, uh, and she was just perfect. Like, uh, she has no needs. She's all taken care of, uh, like a baby in, in their mother's arms, like, or a child at, at home, you know. They just be themselves. So, not everything has to be needs. So, what does this model give us? Well, it starts to give us um, a way to analyze life, including our, especially our own life. And so some of these are observable, these operating principles, and some are not observable. And so we can analyze like altruism, whether it's our own or of another person. And you can see a lot of times things that are altruism, which is basically doing good deeds or uh, giving things to other people, you know, in the spirit of charity. Well, it might not be the spirit of charity that's uh, underlying those actions. You know, it might be that somebody wants security, you know, to get more than what they need. Like for maybe they want to get more points, earn more points to go to heaven. Right. So just to make sure they have enough points in heaven, they're going to, let's say, give somebody a donation, you know, or or hear out a person's um, complaints. It could just be really, they're just meeting their need for security. Or they could just be normal, you see. So maybe they're just satisfying a social need. Maybe everyone in their church is giving, so they'll give something too. Or maybe they're choosing the good over the bad. They're saying, well, I'm going to be a good person, or this is a good thing to do, or that would be bad, you know, etc. So it's all about their self-esteem. You see, so... That can, that can drive lots of what we're doing. And so it really doesn't count as just ignoring our own needs. It's just we're dealing with our needs by being altruistic, let's say. And it could be choosing the better over the worst. So it could be to say, well, like the best way, the best use of my money would be this charity as opposed to that charity, right? So it's my need for freedom that I'm satisfying. Or it could be my, you know, just drive for self-actualization, self-realization. I'm the perfect person, uh, but that I'm trying to be the perfect person, uh, which is different than just being the perfect person. But if I'm going to try to be the perfect person, you know, and I'm un unfolding and actualizing and realizing myself, then, well, I'm, I'm doing these perf perfect things. So, and, or I could just cling to what I have. Now, uh, that's probably a little bit more, maybe not so, not so common, but... Um, Anyways, 
but so those are all observable you can you can kind of see those but you really can't tell like well but maybe that person is actually taking up the needs of another person maybe they are maybe you are right maybe you're more genuine and sincere than you suspect right so that's the beautiful of this theory it says like that is an option that could be happening right and it kind of frees us from this whole mechanical determinism although it also you know we have the we have the we have the operations here but but we also have this freedom and it could be that somebody's just simply perfect okay they just they don't have any needs and maybe they like someone was friendly to somebody and it wasn't to satisfy any need or to help them they just were friendly and they were friendly together let's say and maybe somebody needed a friend so let's just do an application uh this was um before i had thought that out with at my grandmother's like 1994 Four, probably this was in 1989 I was uh, uh, for a year an independent uh, scholar working on my philosophy uh, at um, in Soviet occupied Lithuania at uh, Vilnius University and so uh, that was the year before the Berlin Wall, well, wall fell that was uh, Lithuania's independence movement. So Lithuania was an occupied country, and then within a course of a few years, uh, during the Gorbachev era, it became a independent state. Along then later, shortly thereafter, with the Latvia and Estonia, and then the breakup of the Soviet Union. So um, one thing I noticed was that this Maslow's hierarchy of needs gave a way to analyze what was going on. And so you can think of, uh, just like Maslow was saying, well, a person could be dominated by a particular need at a certain time. You can think of a whole country that its government, basically a government is designed to address one need. Okay, so in a government, there's all these needs out there, but there's a particular need. And so uh, being born and growing up in America, that was a representative democracy, and that was all about freedom, opportunity, liberty. That was um, the essential value of America. I just remember the bicentennial in 1976, 200-year anniversary since uh, the Declaration of Independence was signed, and so freedom, freedom, freedom. And you can think of how Ronald Reagan talked uh, at that time, or uh, all, all of the American presidents. Uh, would emphasize uh, America's value of freedom. And so freedom is quite a high value, and it's higher than self-esteem. So you can think of like the self-esteem is the value of an aristocracy, where you have a class system based on levels of self-esteem, or you may have a bureaucracy. Uh, but what the kind of value that's relevant that's that's in terms of self-esteem is basically partly it's it's the distinctions you know so what's the hierarchy of distinctions but also it's about equality you know so the jury of our peers let's say right is an expression so that means if you're a noble you you should be judged by nobles if you're a farmer you should be judged by farmers uh, and so uh but in a certain sense, like if we're all citizens, we should all be equal, okay? So equality is an issue about self-esteem. And so societies like the Soviet Union or an aristocracy or a bureaucracy or maybe a feudal system, an advanced feudal system, would be about uh, self-esteem and choosing the good over the bad. You see, it's very morally uh, kind of like clear who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. Uh, as opposed to a representative democracy where, like, it's not about who's good. Like, the assumption is that the politicians are not good. <laughs> but it's about, let's can we make things better rather than worse? Can we compromise? You know, so when you have compromises, uh, you know, in terms of tax rates, a little bit more or a little bit less. You have taxes, you have compromise in terms of time, a little bit sooner or a little bit later, and time goes on, so later becomes sooner, and so on. So... It's just a very different issue. And basically, like, in order to go from an aristocracy to a representative democracy, you have to have a certain level of equality that has been produced. And then you can go on to the next level, okay, which would be representative democracy. So 
if I take, if I can maybe explain how government would work um, in the United States at that time, you had, let's say, two parties, and one party would say, yes, we need more opportunity, but Uh, government should do more so that we would all have more opportunity. And the other party say, no, government should do less so that we would all have more opportunity. And there's a huge debates, you know, but they're all talking about opportunity. And they could talk about opportunity because basically this issue of equality um, had kind of been assumed, you know, like, well, all people are created equal. And of course, American history, it wasn't, there was a lot, of, a lot to work out there. But in a certain sense, conceptually, it had been, that was the assumption. The assumptions had been laid And that's why democracy uh, could exist and move on from those uh, assumptions of equality. That um, the American system was not and didn't and, and hasn't been like a, a country that would um, start from scratch and redistribute everything and make everyone equal. Okay, because no, that's that it, it, it built on a historic more or less equality that most of these farmers are basically... kind of like the same. They treat each other the same. They treat each other as a middle class, as equals. They're able to treat each other as equals. That's the basis for moving on. So the reason I bring this up is because in Lithuania, what was so fantastic, you had a people power movement, as they were called. Uh, and this one succeeded. Um, there was one in the Philippines at the time. Uh, they were throughout Eastern Europe. Uh, in China, you had the Tiananmen Square Massacre, but basically... Uh, you had this uh, people powers movement, and it was different uh, than a representative democracy. It manifested a direct democracy, and one of the where it means people are directly involved. People are uh, not acting through their representatives, but people are know how to take action themselves. And uh, Marx, Karl Marx, might like this, but it was a little bit based on the technological. Um, opportunities, which had changed in several hundred years. So, for example, in the United States, when it was founded, um, it would take maybe one or two weeks for a carriage to get to Philadelphia. So, of course, you know, for that representative to get there and represent their constituents. Uh, whereas in Lithuania, uh, even in the Soviet days, but uh, people had phones, they could call in, people had televisions, they could, uh, you know, Uh, people had trolley buses, and so they could show up in a city square, or they could call in to a radio show, or they could call in to a television show, or they could even use, uh, and these weren't very common, and uh, but they could use a photocopy machine, you see, and print a hundred flyers, you know, have their own newsletter. There was a thousand different, let's say, uh, newsletters that sprung up when Gorbachev uh, gave a little bit of freedom. And so that idea that We just need a little bit of freedom, but we don't want to be part of this Soviet Union. We don't want to, you know, we want to have our own ethnic um, country, Lithuania, that would care about our future as a ethnic community, you know, as a ethnic culture, right, with a language, uh, with uh, a history, right, with minorities, you know, but we want to have our own um, our own culture that can be dominant in our own region, and we don't want to... be sucked into some kind of Soviet commonwealth uh, or union all the more so, right? We just want to be independent or we want to join as ultimately happened like a European union where we feel part of a family of kindred cultures that uh, respect us and do not want to um, behave to us chauvinistically as the Russian people did for centuries, you know? So, uh, so that was the vibe in the air where people would, you know, if you have a phone, you can become a organizer. Uh, if you have a fax machine, you can contact uh, Western media, right? So, and even the internet was just barely starting, but uh, so all these were tools for direct democracy. But the presumption was, look, we don't need a lot of freedom. We just need a little bit of freedom so that we could do the things that we want for the self-fulfillment of our people, uh, which is now 30 years later, uh, 35 years later, it's evident, you know, if you look at the wealth of uh, Lithuanian books published, if you looked at the tens of thousands of uh, 
Lithuanian entrepreneurs and innovators and organizers who just come up with these marvelous activities and initiatives and movements that simply were not possible in the Soviet era and really wouldn't be possible even in, if we were part of Russia. They were simply human self-fulfillment uh, as part of a self-fulfillment of a culture, uh, including foreigners and minorities and others. Uh, so, uh, so that idea to say these people who I'm with and I'm a part of, uh, they're not looking to the West to copy the West, you see, to have what the West has. And I think this was simply not, I just realized, like, the assumption by journalists and, and onlookers was, oh, they want what we have, right? And that would include Western liberties and also a consumer society. But it really wasn't driven by a desire for a consumer society, and it really wasn't asking for, you know, total freedom. It was just saying, look, like, I'm an artist. I don't want to draw Lenin. Let me draw a tree, right? Or I don't want to have to think in Russian. Let me think in Lithuanian, you see. Let me let me have an environment in Lithuanian, right? Because back then, like, all signage had to be in two languages, right? Things like that. It was very, uh, which is mentally, culturally very oppressive. So, but... To say, like, even if you had a direct democracy, it's still about a need for self-fulfillment. It's still kind of mechanically driven in that way. It's still about just trying to be the best, you know, or choosing the best or whatever, trying to be perfect. Not about just letting go and being perfect, as Jesus said. He said, he didn't never say try, uh, really. He said, be perfect, like your heavenly father's perfect. And it's not about forgetting yourself and just taking up the needs of another, right? That's maybe, see, government is about, I guess maybe it's 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 about needs. It's not about letting go of needs. Then it wouldn't be a government. I'll give one more example of uh, where um, these uh, needs come up, just to, uh, just to kind of open our minds a bit. But uh, if we look at the Ten Commandments, there's four that are positive, how to love God, and there's six that are negative, uh, uh, how to love your neighbor as yourself, like what not to do, basically. So, uh, And of course, it's different faiths number them in different ways, but this is, metaphysically, this is the way that I, I see that um, I see the logic of it. And so um, this is one way to just notice is to say... Um, do not kill, that seems to address the need for survival, you know, of other people. Uh, do not steal has to do with their security, you know, so that they, they're, they're, the whole notion of property is about security, that you know where your things are so that you could rely on your things and they are your things because you need them for your security. So, um, and then uh, do not adulter, it's about honoring another person's, uh, you know, or, or other people's uh, uh, family, society, uh, community, right? Relationships. And so that seems straightforward. Now these, um, I guess I'm just uh, reading, you know, uh, fishing around for connection. But so then the idea would be like, do not lie could be uh, about uh, not messing with people's self-esteem, right? They're making judgments like what's good or bad. And if you lie, you're, you're interfering with that. Uh, do not covet things, Right. Maybe that would be about, um, you see, so this is like, do not, uh, will mess with people from choosing the better or worse. You see, if you covet somebody's things, that messes with their own judgment about the value of those things, right? Now, all of a sudden, they can't have a, their own personal judgment. It's now impacted, influenced by you, right? And maybe the same with self-fulfillment, you know, so... I mean, if, if, if I'm in love with my sweetheart or the person who could be my sweetheart, you know, these are such, this is like total life questions, you know, especially if you believe in marriage as forever and, and, and only, you know, and this all your life is going to uh, uh, end up in one person, you know, which mine never did. But that's, if you have that attitude, well, then somebody coveting your sweetheart is going to mess up with your evaluation of what's going on. Right. It shouldn't. These things are damaging. OK. In a very subtle way. Right. I think that makes sense to me. So now. That was the first part. 
Now I want to show uh, what I've come up with just recently in the last few weeks uh, uh, in preparing this video. Was uh, I've been thinking a lot about the three minds more and more. Uh, so I first thought about them maybe 12 years ago uh, when my sister, Emma, uh, gave me for Christmas a book by Daniel Kahneman, an American experimental psychologist who won the Nobel Prize for economics uh, for his work uh, with... Uh, his uh, dear collaborator, um, I think it's Amos Tversky, um, or Aaron Tversky, Amos Tversky probably. And so this idea that we have three minds, uh, they talked about system one and system two. System one thinks fast, system two thinks slow. But I'd say there's a system three that thinks even more, uh, well, that's that uh, balances the other two. So... Um, I want to talk about that and how that really shows metaphysically uh, insight into these uh, six needs and the eight operating principles. So let's just, the way I would call these three minds, I'd say there's an answering mind that knows the answers, like, you know, what ice cream do I want? It's pistachio. Now, who knows that? <laughs> it's something in me knows. And um, there is... Um, a questioning mind, okay. So there's a pie, there's a there's a kind of verbal, you know, just kind of monkey in me that's just chattering. But um, I, sus I I conclude basically that really it's about what we don't know, and uh, we consciously don't know it, and those are um, our questions. So like you can look at a word like horse, but it's really just a variable that says, oh, I don't know what a horse is, what's a horse? And then your other mind can give you a picture of a horse or it can give you some kind of feeling for what a horse is. But the word is just like a placeholder and then you know you lift up that placeholder, it's like asking a question and you get an answer. So you have this whole mind that's uh, uh, connecting all these placeholders, all these variables, all these slots, and that's a conceptual language. And we may have like 100,000 concepts um, but whereas the answers are given to us by a mind that's meshed with the world through a neural network with, I think it's 100 billion neurons or 86 billion neurons, but it's a lot of neurons. Uh, uh, so what the concepts are doing, though, is they're allowing us to kind of um, do some validation logically, like to kind of break things down and double check and have... Uh, rationality and logic uh, uh, give some input into the BS mind, which is the chat GPT mind, which is the know-it-all mind, which really doesn't know anything in a certain sense in terms of in a well-grounded way, but it's just always hallucinating its answers, right? So so uh, you have the 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 mind that uh, that's babble, you know that's talking and then the mind that's but can see, Right, and then you have this mind that can see, and you have the mind that's blind but can can ask questions. Anyway, so there's these two minds in dialogue. And then the third third mind, consciousness, investigates. It matches up the questions with the answers. So and so basically, a lot of that is the un you know there's a model that the conscious has imposed on the unconscious, and if it's a good model, you'll be at peace. But as life goes on, you start to get. Um, uh, things not fitting in the model and you get emotions and moods and so then you worry well how can I adjust the model or change the world or or respond but what consciousness does it kind of holds the brake it says wait 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 don't impose a new model until we really feel it's right okay and so then it's putting order in it so that you know to ensure this compatibility between the the model the conscious is imposing and the and the, the um, real-life uh, information the unconscious is organizing. And when that model fits together, uh, so then it releases that break, you hardwire it. Uh, but then the consciousness can also choose, like, well, do I let the unconscious just uh, do its thing um, automatically? Or should I say, no, 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 like we're walking on a high bridge and I want now to have the conscious mind uh, be in charge? Or vice versa, you know, like what things do you allow yourself to do automatically and what things do you kind of like break down and say, hey, these are my taxes and I need to do them very carefully. 
So that's the model. And uh, if if you, I encourage you uh, to visit uh, www.theorytranslator.com, which is a database I've started um, uh, where I'm giving examples of these conceptual structures. And so at this point, I have 148 examples uh, from the history of culture and philosophy and, uh, you know, West and East and around the world um, about um, how these for example, three minds, answering, questioning, investigating, how they appear to various thinkers, philosophers, uh, writers, poets, uh, scientists. So go take a look at that. But now let's think, okay, so how does this relate to the needs and the, what we talked about before? Well, one thing, the unconscious mind is basically, in a certain sense, it's enmeshed with the body. So in a certain sense, it is the body. You know, it's like, you know, if you want to distinguish between the brain and the mind, the unconscious mind is like the brain, let's say. And it's also enmeshed in the past. Everything it's done is based on the past. Uh, so it's an integration of all the information that have been absorbed in the past and what's known. So uh, that's one angle on uh, life. And then from an evolutionary perspective, we also have a mind, uh, and this is probably true of every creature that has uh, two brain hemispheres. It's probably the reason why we have two brain hemispheres, whether we're uh, vertebrates, starting like with fish, or even octopuses, which aren't vertebrates, but uh, they also have two brain hemispheres. So why, why, why? So the theory is that, well, you want to have two minds uh, with the same information. Okay, and of course, uh, when you have two brains, you're going to implement all kinds of things in all kinds of ways with that. But from a user requirements point of view, you want this kind of like division of resources, um, probably built in even, you know, so that to kind of encourage this type of uh, distinction. So you're going to part of your mind is focused on what you know, but more and more through evolution, your mind will also be wanting to predict and think about what you don't know. And so our minds are very much like that. Like we live in a hologram where uh, most of our nerves are coming uh, to, from the brain to the world saying, well, I predict this apple's here. I predict this table's here. And if something's not true, then let me know. Okay. That's probably why our cortexes are uh, so big. It's because we're like gamers and we're simulating the universe with our minds. So a lot of it is uh, focused on the unknown uh, the future so we're when we use language when we're dealing with these models when we're playing these kind of linguistic logical games we're kind of leaning into the future into the unknown and so then consciousness is kind of like uh disconnected from either and so in that sense it's between the past and future or it's simply in the present okay and now it's just a flickering thing uh, you may think, you know, I may think that uh, we live in the present all the time, but the fact is, is that we're mostly on autopilot, and that autopilot is either leaning into the past or it's leaning into the future. When we snap out of autopilot, I go, oh, no, I'm living in the present. <laughs> okay, so, and then it's focused on the general situation. Okay, so let's take a look specifically how that plays out here. So then the distinction between the body and the psyche is a distinction between the unconscious this neural network, and the conscious, uh, this conceptual language we've invested ourselves in. So the unconscious is concerned for the known past, what we know. And in doing so, apparently, uh, it's modeling these three minds. Okay? So the un from the unconscious point of view, when it looks at, you know, when it's expressing the concerns related to the body, related to what we know and the past, it's saying, well, first of all, there's survival. Okay? So that's leaning strongly on that past okay so it's like the unconscious how it understands the unconscious right it's concerned for the unconscious but the unconscious is also concerned for the conscious uh that's the security saying hey but we also need to keep an eye out for what's coming up okay which is future looking right but then it's also saying yeah but then we could just let go of the past let go of the future and just think in general Right? And if you think in general, you're kind of like letting go of yourself. But you're 
concerned with anybody who would be like in your situation. So you're basically concerned for everybody, right? You have this ability to be communal and just worrying about everybody, every human, maybe even more than a human, maybe dolphins or maybe more than dolphins, right? Like, so maybe angels. So you can be part of this community. And then that's just concern in general. And that's the social, right? But all those three are from the prism of the unconscious through the body. It's embodied, right? And then uh, you can do the same thing with the conscious. So, but that's disembodied. All the evidence for the embodied mind is also evidence for the, from an evolutionary point of view, of the disembodying mind. You know, that the mind that moves more and more towards abstraction, towards being a mind, towards being conscious, towards predicting the future, towards just um, moving resources away from the real past and towards the unreal future, right? So, and the same thing repeats. So now uh, the unconscious starts with the concern for the past, but now it's from us in terms of the psyche. So this whole conceptual language of 100,000 concepts that you've built up and organized, uh, and I have too, uh, that's our self-esteem is expressed by that, right? It's invested in that. And then we lean forward and say, yeah, we'd like to grow and learn and take advantage of opportunities. And so that's freedom is what lets us do that. And then to kind of like let go of those two and say, yeah, but we'd like this for everybody. Okay, so if we can, and the way we relate our, uh, let's say, past and future is by being perfect, kind of like being the perfect, uh, by fitting exactly, like uh, connecting them exactly, let's say. But it's a concern in general, and then it'll help everybody. That'll be like a universal, maybe it'll help God, but it'll it's be universal. So uh, that's the self-fulfillment. So that's unconscious conscious, but in the gap is where we have this consciousness, this concern in general. And you see, what seems interesting here is that with the concern in general, which is just taking up the needs of anybody, uh, there isn't this body psyche distinction or this known or unknown distinction or past or future or unconscious conscious. You don't need an unconscious conscious uh, distinction. And maybe like a very practical way to see this, like when you're helping somebody and you're trying to figure out what they need or or you're trying to s just do what the needs done kind of becomes irrelevant. Are they conscious or are they unconscious? Like, do they know that they're hurting? Uh, like, that, do they know that their hand is bleeding or do they not know? Like, do they know that they're having mental issues or do they not know? In a certain sense, it's probably not relevant typically, you see? It's just about embracing them. And it's not about you needing to really worry too much about, is it like, you know, what is it? You just give up thinking about yourself. You're just focusing on them. It's very liberating. It's very freeing. And it's saying that this is how we free ourselves of the body and the psyche. We live in the third mind. And then you can, uh, you can kind of also make sense that, well, there doesn't have to be any concern, right? So you have this gap between the two. And I think... I think the conscious is maybe like serving the, well, the, it's the same thing. Like, so the unconscious speaks to the conscious through emotions, but then consciousness is allowing the conscious to re-impose a new model upon the unconscious in order for it to be at home, let's say, and, and, and be met and be understood and etc. So I like this model, but there's more. So now a crucial thing, and this is where, um, um, well, I, I uh, study scripture. I'm Catholic. Uh, I uh, respect God. I think a lot about God because I'm basically trying to do godly things, like know everything, apply that usefully. So God is my competition. Jesus is my competition. So I kind of want to get to know my competition and, you know, have the proper relation, which is... Um, uh, great deep respect, um, uh, uh, engagement, and um, appreciation, and uh, understanding of you know life on the edge, uh, what that means, um, and then there's an endearment, I would say. So, on the path of love, let's say. So. One of the things I want to point to, uh, so I do study the Gospels, uh, 
And uh, there are eight I am statements. Uh, Adrian Hunter of Ivy League Tutoring in Chicago, uh, who ran away from home, I think, to study at Moody Bible School at the age of 16. But he uh, told me about the I am statements. Uh, he thought uh, I should know about that. So if you know something like this, go to Theory Translator or leave a comment or, or whatever. I, you can see I'm, I, you can affect me deeply. And so he said, well, um, he learned that um, there are eight statements, uh, I am, that Jesus says in the Bible. And there probably is like one war uh, in John 4. He talks to the woman at the well. And I think he asks, I am the living waters or something like that. So well, that's probably, I don't know if I don't include that one. I forget. Uh, so, but... I was interested, you know, so that's something I'll spend hours thinking about, trying to, you know, organize, etc. So I did notice, oh, this was in the 90s. So afterwards, I noticed, oh, um, this seems to match uh, these uh, this Maslow hierarchy of needs and these eight uh, operating principles. So uh, in the sense that, um, but what they're doing here, so for example, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, well, you could say, okay, well, that looks like it could relate to survival, right? But the point is, is what he seems, what I think he's saying is um, we all have this choice that opens up. You see, this was so mechanical, right? We have these mechanical needs. Now, are we just robots? You know, are we just, uh, but first of all, there's this consciousness, this third mind that frees up the opportunity to just not worry about body, psyche, distinctions, not worry about uh, what we know or don't know, but just live, in, just live in that gap. And also to kind of open up uh, the possibility of God, you know, like, like maybe we don't have a needs, you know, at some points or whatever. So this idea that, okay, there's myself, but there's also God. And when I apply these operating principles... I have a choice. Am I going to apply them with my reference point as myself or apply them with my reference point as God? So, and these are going to be what it means to apply them with regard to God. So, if when I cling to what I have, I cling to the glory of God, you see, and there's like Psalms where David says, you know, God, you know, you can't let me go down because uh, what are your enemies going to say? They're going to say, you know, you're no good God, right? Like, you got to save me, God, because you're going to look bad, right, if, if I go down. Uh, so if you cling to the glory of God, then you, even if you do go down, you'll be resurrected and alive, right? So don't cling to yourself. Cling to the glory of God. And then the intent of God, what is the gate for? He goes, I am the gate for the sheep. Well, that means that the sheep are protected, and then they go out beyond the gate, and then they come back into the gate. So they have what they need, but then they have more than what they need, and then they come back and they have that. So so I am the gate of the sheep. And so that's um, getting more than what you need. That's the intent of God, right? And then what's connecting that intent and that glory, right, uh, and making it, you know, social and, and just general, ap applicable to anybody. Well, then that would be the example of God, I think, that Jesus is giving when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So, um, that if, if, that what's normal, right? So the idea is to avoid extremes, be normal. Well, what's normal? Am I normal or is God normal? If God is normal, then Jesus, you know, it's the example of God. That's And Jesus would be the example of God, the way, the truth, and the life, right? So that would be the normality of it. Um, now then, you can look now in terms of the psyche. And here, um, it can be um, not so much what we're doing, you know, to cling to God or to appreciate God or to follow in God. But what is God doing to us? Like, so the love of God. So when he says, I am the good shepherd, he's saying, you know, don't place your self-esteem in your own self, in your own choices of the good or the bad. God loves you through me. 
God chose you as good. And so I am the good shepherd. I gave up my life for the sheep, right? Uh, I care about you. That shows like how precious you are to God. That's the source of your self-esteem that cannot be, you know, destroyed. Don't, you know, do that. And then the work of God, he's saying, look, I am the light of the world, okay? So this is the work of God, like for God to be able to, you know, basically for you to be able to, for, for me to be able to join in that work, okay? If we're doing the work of God, like if we're being the light of the world, uh, or if we're, you know, appreciating maybe Jesus is the light of the world, but uh, in spreading that light, but we're going to have lots of freedom. There's so many ways we can do that. You know, if you want real, genuine freedom, do the work of God. That gives you the freedom you want. So don't just be loved by God, but go out and do work of God. And you'll have not just self-esteem, but you'll have all this freedom. Okay. And then, um, well, where does that lead to? Then it says, well, then it could be uh, self-fulfillment. Well, then that's about everybody, right? Like, so not everybody could have self-esteem and freedom. Everybody... Uh, psyche could be surviving and thriving. So if you want to be perfect in that and be f completely self-fulfilled and self-realized and actualized and unfolded and completely, well, then embrace the command of God, you know, embrace and say, look, God, in enjoy the power of being commanded, you know, to say, look, God commanded me, you know, what is God commanding me? That's where my perfection is. You know, God commanded me to make the most of my life, let's say, right? And if you can center that kind of uh, into, into God's command, well, then that's very, um, that's a very, becomes a very firm ground. None of this is about whether God is real or true or not. This is just the logic that's opened up, right? And so that's the past, that's the future, now the present. So then the other one, okay, we'll take up the needs of another. He says, I am the bread of life. It kind of reminds of communion. But the way I think of communion is basically he is saying, look, this is my body uh, and it's supposed to be eaten by me becoming, I mean, this is my bread and it's if it's mine uh, in the sense of the self, let's say if it's mine and I eat it, it's going to become part of my body, my glucose and etc. It's going to be all in me, my flesh. But if I interrupt that, and hey, say, no, no, this is mine, but you're going to eat it. Well, by the laws of nature, you're eating his body, right? Because the laws of, by you know, if the laws of nature are irreversible, well, we know what that bread is. It is his body. It's one and the same because it's his. He's supposed to eat it. Now he's violating these laws of, you know, he's abusing these laws of nature by having you eat it or me eat it, right? So that's the bread of life. But it's about being in that gap, you see. So if you take up the needs of another uh, in that way, that whole distinction between the unconscious, conscious, consciousness, like it all goes away. You don't need minds to do that. You see, you don't need to have any mind to do that, to take up the need of another. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be a mental thing. And then finally, just be perfect. I am. So this is all about that choice between self and God. Another place this comes up, I think, is in the Beatitudes. Now, this is a different structure, and um, but it does. In, so, this is going to be in a in a future uh, episode, uh, and I'll talk about this at the end. Uh, this is a structure I call the Eightfold Way. It's the same as um, Buddha's Eightfold Way. Is it, well, there's three variants, but the the fir I first recognized the Buddha's Eightfold Way seemed very important. Uh, it's got these two foursomes, uh, and they've got three sums inside them. And if there's two of them, it's like a two sum. So if you're familiar with wondrous wisdom and like the division of everything into two perspectives, three perspectives, four perspectives, like this is basically the the most intense compact structure. So, uh, but here uh, in this particular variant, uh, this gradation, like I would call it, of these six levels, also shows up. So he's uh, at the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he's telling, it starts off by just telling people, uh, you know, blessed are uh, the poor in spirit, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, I understand as skeptical, like scientists, you know, so the martyrs are rich in spirit. They say, oh, I believe and just do whatever, you know. But I'm not like that. Uh, maybe you're not like that if you're watching this show, or, or maybe you are, but but I'm, a, I'm poor in spirit. It says, look, 
I'll believe a little bit, right? <laughs> but show me what's the consequence of that belief. Like, do I gain something from it? You know, am I better off for it, right? Spiritually or, or in any other way. So I'm poor in spirit, uh, be kind and show me what I can get for that, right? As I give a little bit at a time. So, and somehow like that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about, okay? So in the kingdom of heaven saying like this earthly mechanistic uh, thing where like every, there's a need, there's operating principle. It's saying, look, I want to be skeptical about that, you know, and I want to think, well, maybe there's a, a bigger another way of looking at this right i don't want to go off this from this world into some kind of fairyland you know and just uh, forget about this world no i just want a little bit of slack a little bit of spirit and see like what's that all about how does that work so with that little bit you can see well first of all there's this need for survival and he's saying blessed are those who mourn they will be comforted Okay, now what he's saying is just so over the top, it's just kind of makes sense of it. But I think what we'll see is that this may help make some sense to it. So he's saying, look, you got this need for survival and people are dying, right? But if you have that little bit of spirit, you will be comforted. You know, you'll become uh, something can happen that you would be comforted. Now you have this need for security, okay? And that's because there are the gentle, or they say the meek, right? Like you know, people who are looking a little bit ahead and saying, man, I'm not very strong. And this is some rough kids on the block. And, and this is, um, I'm going to maybe stay meek, but it's meek. Well, they're going to inherit the earth. Just a little bit of spirit will, is enough for them to inherit the earth. Okay, if they have a little bit, and if there is a little bit, they, they can do that. He's saying, look, you may have social needs, right? But if there's a little bit of spirit, you know, the ones who hunger for righteousness, right? So they have social needs, but a little bit on the spiritual side, right? Again. And so also, like, if you mourn, there's a little bit of spirit in you. You wouldn't be mourning if there was no spirit in you. You wouldn't be meek if there was no spirit in you. And you wouldn't hunger for righteousness if there wasn't a little bit of spirit in you. But the fact that there is means that there will be a little spirit is enough. It'll satisfy. You'll be satisfied. These are kind of like promises, but um, but at least we're starting to see the logic, maybe. And then it switches over. And, okay, now, so these are the psychic needs, but it's it's not about so much about what's happening to us, but about like what we can be doing, right? So blessed are the merciful. Uh, so that could be some king or some, you know, boss or, or some father. But um, if they have a little bit of the spirit... Uh, they must if they're merciful. And they'll be shown mercy, which means there'll be a little bit of spirit given to them. And that implies that there's somebody bigger than them out there who would show them mercy. And that implies there's somebody bigger than them. And it probably kind of leads up all the way up to God or somebody, you know, but they're saying like, God is on the side of this little bit of spirit, right? That's where the promise is going. And then... Pure of heart. Okay, so let's say if you're pure of heart, which means, you know, and you're future looking and you see things how they are, you know, going back to this skeptical, like, and you, if you're pure of heart, well, what could that possibly mean? But it means like you're seeing through this all and you don't know what to see, but it's going to be like you're going to see through it all, all the way out to God. Like, so I, that tower of mercy, let's say, right? The merciful, it, it, it kind of, it, it's maybe saying like, you know, you're going to see the top of the tower, right? And then peacemakers. So the ones who are connecting the merciful with the pure of heart, right? The ones who are responding to this and trying to make it work. Well, they will be called the children of God because they do the work that God does, Right? So that's uh, self-fulfillment. And then blessed at the end, again, it's the kingdom of heaven for the persecuted for righteousness, right? So when I say God does not have to be good, life is not fair, that's what all this is about, right? These are all the ways life is not fair, let's say. And, um, you know, I think in, in every religion, um, it, there, are, there, there can be testimony of martyrs or people who have been um, saints, you know, and people, but people who have been... Uh, horribly uh, mistreated, abused, and killed, and tortured uh, because 
they were on God's side, they were on the side of the Spirit, they were on the side of um, not this world, but something beyond, that little bit of slack, let's say, that little bit of Spirit. So it's all about them, you see, and it all com comes down to them, and that that's about taking up the needs of another. See, that's what they were persecuted for. They were persecuted for all of us. So this is... Um, We'll go back to this structure at the very end, but I just want to say um, that just shows uh, how deep this Maslow's hierarchy is in this version. This is if you have those six levels, not if you have five, not if you have eight or nine, right? Like uh, that's the advantage of math for wisdom or structure for wisdom is that you can have a language of wisdom and not just some kind of like... Uh, uh, theory of the moment or whatever, right? But to have absolute truth, right? Uh, this is modeling absolute truth. Um, that's at least uh, the purpose of Math for Wisdom. The attempt, right? The endeavor, the science. So another thing to add to this, uh, why, where this comes up, where this is significant, um, and I notice this from the theory of narrative. So those six levels um, in, in that last structure uh, or, yeah, the Beatitudes, that, I had a theory of narration, which I actually worked on in 1989 and in 1988 in Soviet-occupied Lithuania. That's what I was doing there uh, and studied Lithuanian folk tales, uh, 60 of them. And I came with a theory of narration and basically there was an object of, um, there were these, the stories would be breaking up into units of tension you know, that there's this central character, let's say, the hero, and they're uh, attacked, you know, and then uh, by some creator of tension, and then the tension, so the tension's created and relaxed, and it goes on that, it keeps our attention. So the creator of tension would go through these Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, first, they're a nobody, like a child, let's say a stepchild. I mean, there's just a the child is born, then their mother dies, their stepchild, and then uh, their 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 stepmother treats them badly, and then their father puts them on a raft and keeps them in a lake, and then calls them for food, you know, like uh, milk and cheese. And then their stepmother tries to trick them and got tricks them to come home, and then you know goes on from there. But the what's happening is that you go through these needs, and the character becomes more uh, fleshed out. So starting with a, just a physical location. Uh, survival but becoming security someone who could be uh, a you know a, a victim let's say and then social need uh, which could be these cravings even for food or things like that like milk mother's milk let's say and then it goes on to these other needs until they're all uh, expanded and they become a full person as a character but what i want to say is that there were four of these um levels that had to do with the voice for creating tension and that was, uh, there's four ways to create tension in a story. You can force, you can command, you can explain, or you can care. At least those are like the four levels. So like if I want you to take your uh, coat off, I could force you to do it. If I was the sun and made everything so hot that you couldn't help but take it off, that's forcing in a story. I could command it because I take off that coat. Or I could explain, like if you took your coat off, you wouldn't feel so warm. Or I could ask, would you like me to take your coat? Okay, so those are four ways to getting the same thing done. Uh, and so what I noticed here um, was that um, that relates to these uh, four levels. The forcing will be the highest level, the social level here, which is kind of like the base level. But then one, two, three would be like, so forcing is like kind of like the natural world, like it's not even in the mental world. But one, two, three would be commanding, explaining, and caring, let's say. And so those will be uh, those other three. And let's take a look here. It will be more clear. So if I look, um, and this is kind of like um, uh, we've been uh, in Math for Wisdom uh, and Econet, uh, we've been uh, thinking about ecological thinking and ecological practice. And so what is ecological thinking? But the, the model I came up uh, for that uh, based on what people said, but it's also based on a study of morality and the Holocaust and things like that, that uh, there's just these men, there's these ways we look at our situation, let's say. You can say we all have the same shared fate. 
down here in the bottom. But, so like in the Holocaust, let's say, um, well, it was horrible, but let's say all of the Jewish people were doomed to be killed. Okay, that was the attitude, that was the uh, circumstance, that was what was happening. But then the question is, uh, but what if individuals are saved? You know, there are individual fates. Actually, each person is separately, you know, has another. So the idea is that, well, if you can help, and despite the fact that they're all going to be killed, but look, but if you can save one person, that's getting somewhere. That's something. Okay? So uh, individual fates matter, not just the shared fate. And that there's something about uh, giving, you know, uh, attention to individual fates. But then it's not just about fates, it's about dreams. You know, like, so these little potted plants, like, but they want to be different kinds of flowers, you know. So honoring people's individual dreams that they want to do, they have individual aspirations, let's say. So the first one might be just nature. Like nature is, you know, nature is always natural and there's nothing much you can do about it, which is the strange thing about ecology. Like it's hard to do something unnatural because we're all part of nature. So the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. But you can pull a living being out of nature. So you can say, well, look, I want to care about particular living beings. Okay. But then a human being is not just a living being, but a human being has aspirations. Okay. Maybe other living beings do too. But so that's a different status. But then as humanity, maybe this ecologically is the purpose of humanity. Like we have a shared dream which kind of integrates all of our individual dreams. So this idea, no, no, there's no shared dream. It's just, uh, you know, everyone out for themselves on their dream, which is the way some people would interpret democracy, let's say. Uh, that's anti-human. Uh, that's sinful. Uh, that's destructive. Uh, that's not. Um, that's not right. A shared dream. You know, we have individual dreams, and that's a building level, let's say. But we're proceeding towards a shared dream, and to deny a shared dream, to not allow people to work together on that, is to not understand what humanity is all about. But you can't get to a shared dream by just treating it like a shared fate. First, you have to fragment everything. Then individuals can have aspirations, and then you can come together. So you're recreating nature as humanity. And that humanity hopefully can be expansive, including chimpanzees and dolphins and pets and whoever in some way, but in terms of like a, as, a, as a community of aspiration, right? Maybe ant colonies, right? So in these four levels, you can see the, I think what I can see is like the social need. So shared fate is just saying, okay, like physically we have a social need, but that's just a starting point. Because each individual needs self-esteem. But that's just one level. Uh, you know, they need that's their starting point. But they need to have freedom to kind of like adjust their lives and be themselves and uh, pursue their dreams. But that's just a level because then those dreams are going to come true when they all come true together. Okay, in as much as they can all come true together. You can't, you can't have a, this is where meaningfulness comes in, self-fulfillment, right? It's not fulfilling just to have your own dream. It's fulfilling to have your dream be part of everybody's dream. And everybody dreams for you, and you dream for everybody, all their dreams too. So we come back together. And so then if you go back to those tones of voice, like forcing, well, that's what the shared fate's about. It's just forcing. Individual fates, it's all about commanding, perhaps commanding ourselves, right? And then individual dreams, it's about articulating, explaining, but shared dream is about caring and trying to get them all to fit together. So this you can see um, how we have this language of wondrous wisdom. We have basic uh, uh, fundamental concepts like the three minds. Um, I didn't show them here, but if you watch the videos, like you have these divisions of everything uh, into two perspectives, like free will and fate, or three perspectives for taking a stand, following through, reflecting, or four perspectives for like levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. So you take those, then you can build up more sophisticated structures or recognize that more sophisticated structures are, um, are uh, meaningful, like Maslow's hierarchy. You see how, how wonderful metaphysics we got out of this, right? By Because we had the building blocks. But then you can say, oh, and here you, you need something like scripture or divine inspiration or just the Holy Spirit because 
how can a human mind come up with these eightfold concepts, you know, just living out a life, right? Like we can come up with three or four or five or maybe six, but my mind, you know, and I think what Winger's wisdom shows like coming up with these eightfold structures is just too much for my mind because you have to completely flatten yourself. You really have to think like God, you know, you have to, you have to be able to think in pure consciousness uh, in that third mind, just start from there, right? Or and just be meditating on God and just be completely um, centered in that as you look into the world. Uh, that's not where I came from. But scriptures give us uh, that hand held out and we can take that hand like we can we can see, wow, here's a clue to uh, embrace. So that's what we're doing uh, with Math Wisdom is building a community of people who are uh, transcending our current society by figuring out this language of wisdom, discovering, uncovering, and seeing that in each other, and seeing, you know, learning to behave differently, learning to behave based on consciousness, based on investigation, rather than just having snappy answers and snappy questions. Uh, also, I want to add that... Um, so so the divinity of Jesus in terms of these structures just seems kind of obvious to me, you know, based on my grappling with this uh, compared to me, right? Like, I'm not divine. Uh, he's divine, uh, just based on structural thinking. Um, but I can think in a divine way, and the things I'm telling you I think are divine. And so then we have these choices. Do we want to live not divine, or do we want to live divine? Okay, do we want to be attached to ourselves or do we want to be attached to God, right? If we're attached to God, we're free of ourselves. Or we don't even have to be attached to God. We just, this also shows that even if we're attached to ourselves, but we can let go of ourselves by taking up the needs of another, living, living uh, immersed in others, you know, in terms of all. And even within the unconscious and the conscious, there's also this idea that for the unconscious, even with that prism, but you have the social needs. If you focus on the social needs and being normal, you're contributing a lot. If you focus on um, the psychic needs of the conscious, let's say, but focus on self-fulfillment, you know, being extreme, being perfect, uh, trying to be perfect, so to speak, um, being that reference point for other people in their lives so that they could choose, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down regarding you. But they have that. You, you're giving them freedom, too. You're opening them up uh, to choice and to freedom by being extreme in the, in the way you think uh, you think uh, is self-fulfilling. So, so in conclusion, uh, this is just one of four uh, eightfold structures uh, that I'll be introducing. This is the first video in this series. Uh, and so uh, this was about the body and its needs, you know, where body includes the psyche, let's see. Um, but um, if I could compare God with human, and so this is based on the limits of my imagination, but I don't think that they're that different than the limits of your imagination, unless, well, we can talk about that, leave notes in the comments. But with regards to God, it's about... Um, God going beyond himself into God, or let's say God going beyond herself into God. So God being transcendent, which is to say. And so the, the, this is simply imagining a primordial God who's before us, before time, before space, before logic, before love, before anything really, just in this void. And that's all there is, is this God all by themselves, let's say. And the question is, what could ever come out of that? And the idea is that the only thing that could really motivate that God is the issue of necessity. Like, is God necessary? Would there be a God if there was not? Because being and not being is the same for God. It's just words. But this idea that if God was not, but it's still God, God should still be. Right? So that's interesting. So you get like a proof by contradiction. Like, if there's God, then there's God. But suppose there's not God, but then there should still be God if there, if, you know, otherwise God just doesn't make sense. So imagine that, and then so how does God do proof like that? Well, then God has to remove God's self, and but God didn't even have a self. So God creates their self upon removing their self. Like God creates the world in that sense, like everything is God's self that arises uh, when God removes God's self. I mean, when God removes God, 
then the left, you get everything. Let's see. God is spirit. Everything is structure, right? So structure arises when spirit removes itself. It's There's the structure that remains. And so, and then where does God go? Well, God can go, the only place to go is into itself, right? So kind of all funny. But so God goes beyond himself into himself. And I'm just so confident about this because, you know, I've thought about this for 40 years, but there really isn't much else to think about because there's nothing else there. Like if you start with so little, that's that's the advantage of it. So what that looks like as regard to these structures, you see, this was about needs. But if you don't have about needs, it's about self-sufficiency. It's about wishing for nothing. Okay. So in this process, you can think of wishing as this transcending. And you can say, well, there's these stages you can mark off uh, in our minds. Let's say, God wishes for nothing is self-sufficient. But we don't wish for nothing. We have needs. Uh, and we have bodies with those needs. And also, God wishes for something. God is certain. But we don't, we're not certain. We have uh, doubts. We have minds with doubts. And God wishes for anything. God is calm. Uh, but we are not calm. We have expectations, hearts with expectations. And God was, wishes for everything. God is loving. God wishes even for the nonsense that we dream up. You know, God, we may, we're like little children who want toys that don't exist. And then God takes those concerns seriously, you know, like just as a parent would. So uh, God is loving, but we're not loving. Uh, we have wills with values. So you see, to be loving would be to be everywhere at once. Uh, we don't do that. We focus ourselves with wills, okay? And so we end up with different wills, with different values. Uh, you know, if you ask people their deepest value in life, which includes all their other values, I've got 800 answers, you know, from 800 people. They're all basically different. So uh, they're all aspects of love. But God, God's deepest value is just them all, like, you know, love everywhere. So to kind of um, see, so we have, God has wishes, but we have reservations. We don't wish. And because we have identities thereby, you see. So the fact that we have a body and we want to stay in that body, we want to be true to that body, that's not what God is about. That's not what God does. So God doesn't have a body in that sense. So uh, to, um, but we have bodies because we identify ourselves and we have minds because we identify ourselves and we have hearts because we identify ourselves and we have wills because we identify ourselves. And God has none of that. God just kind of like is headstrong and just says, oh, well, do am I necessary? Well, let's see. If if I was not, what happens? And God disappears, and then God's reappearing. And in this process, uh, by saying, well, in this process, um, God was first outside of him, herself, let's say, and then God was entering herself, and then God was, you know, looking from the end, you know, re referencing when he says, was, was entering herself, and then God was in herself, and then in everything, let's say, and then that was loving. Okay, so that's the big picture. We'll have structures for all these. Let's just flash through them. Uh, this is the structure for the minds. Now, you can see that uh, this will be about taking a perspective in a situation, and there will be seven ways to do that, and there will be an eighth way. So all these basically have seven plus one, let's say, uh, ways about them. But this one now has a connecting line, so to speak, a connecting channel. The, the one that we had uh, to go all the way back, let's just go back here. Uh, there was no connecting channel. This was all in parallel. The relationship between the unconscious and the conscious basically is existing in parallel, disconnected, so to speak. Um, it's kind of curious, but it's saying like they're in sync in some way, but they're disconnected. But in the mind, they're going to be connected, first of all, by one channel, and that'll be the unconscious is going to connect it. So in the world, everything's just disconnected. you got a body and you got a psyche, and they're kind of like in sync, but they're not directly connected. Uh, so to speak, you have a conceptual language and you have a neuron implementation and they just kind of like in sync, but they're, it really is like a mind body, a body mind duality in, in just a funny way. Uh, it manages to, and I think that's the physical evidence is that we have these conceptual languages and we have these neuronal implementations and they're in sync, but they're not, uh, uh, I don't think people are going to, like, I think that they're just, there's a gap between them. They're evolved, they're co-evolving. 
you see there's it's on it's on two different uh, layers so to speak the user requirement layer and the physical implementation layer are both uh, equally vibrant and they're given by those but then but the, on in the mental level they're becoming connected so it can be connected through the unconscious that be one channel and that happens in the mind in the heart which is the emotional life so to speak um then there'd be two channels uh one for the you know what's happening in the world and one the self so the self are the things we know and that's why we feel sad or or happy basically content or disgusted but out you know regarding the things we care about so whereas we feel surprised or excited or frightened regarding the things that are more theoretical or unknown or just out in the world so when active inference talks about minim minimizing surprise but they're not talking about minimizing sadness which is kind of curious um, because uh it's it's the parallel universe right like and actually minimizing sadness is uh, morally very problematic what you want to minimize would be uh anxiety which is a bad form of suspense and uh, it's the form when you're wishing for things you're expecting things you don't want let's say anyway so but there's this is going to be two channels the unconscious and the conscious but then when we have these structures um for the will and what it means to follow, you know, our will, God's will. Um, and then you need three channels for the, separately, for the unconscious, conscious, and consciousness. And that's basically what you need for these narration, the language of narration, uh, which I mentioned. Uh, because I think, like, to have these units of tension where something happens, you know, you need someone to cause attention, you need someone to be the object of attention, and you need someone to intervene one way or the other to relax the tension. So that's probably these three minds. Um, the unconscious is the target of the tension. The conscious is imposing the tension. It's going to impose that cognitive model. And the consciousness is basically either telling it, no, it's too early, or saying, yeah, go ahead and impose it. Uh, whereas here, there's not, in the emotional life, you're not going to have the consciousness. You're just going to have the conscious. And uh, I mean, it's not going to have its own channel, basically. So this will be... Um, I think this will be for the language of um, verbalization. How do things get meaning? And um, and they get meaning, and then it'll be about, I think, the truth of the heart and the world and how they, they conflict. There's like two truths all the time. And this one would be um, the mind. It's going to be about the language of argumentation. How do things come to matter? But it's really about the unconscious, which is kind of curious, you know. So although it's it's cognition, but it's really about how does the unconscious um, experience that and what comes of that and what kind of patterns uh, go for that. And so like we're studying economics and ecological thinking, whatever, but it's it's really about this pattern language of uh, optimality by which things come to matter. Uh, so that's where things are headed. And then this one is uh, for the language of narration is how do things actually happen? Okay. So, in conclusion, uh, here are exercises. Uh, there's all kinds of places where um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs comes up either because he influenced people or he didn't, but you can, I think you can see them in there. So the exercises here are to try to look at these. Now, of course, Karl Marx uh, was in the 19th century, so he wasn't um, temporally influenced by Maslow. Um, some of these people were influenced for different reasons. Um, some of these are uh, in terms of social systems, governmental structures, uh, cultural uh, ways of looking at things. Some of these are in terms of moral development, uh, children's development, um, uh, human development. Uh, but they're all kind of like, I think, going back to this same structure, ex with one exception. I'm not going to tell you which. You'll have to just uh, challenge yourself with these exercises. If you find this interesting, um, if you come up with some ideas, uh, leave them in the comments. Uh, contact me uh, at uh, my email, uh, which you'll find, and uh, you know, join our discussion group. And um, if you're interested, uh, I would gladly. I hope there will be interested people to uh, who who take a look, work on these exercises, and then I'll invite you. We'll have a show where we can talk about that by Zoom and um, uh, discuss, you know, what do we do? Like, do we, do we get similar results or different results? Uh, can we have a science of this? You know, that would be very uh, great. I think that's the whole point of Math for Wisdom. 
thank you for watching. And um, I just want to maybe conclude with my prayer to say that we can have a language of wisdom. Uh, these things can and are super practical in life. Uh, this does help us live uh, as uh, wonderful human beings and connect with each other and uh, appreciate uh, what we are and can do with our lives and how we can have a kingdom of heaven where God is active and participative and welcome in this world in ways that make us all the more free and uh, and self-fulfilled and uh, and uh, united peace and love thank you for watching this video please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our math for wisdom discussion group and our study groups thank you for liking this video for subscribing to this youtube channel and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I am John Harland. I lead the physics study group for Math for Wisdom. And uh, I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom because the conversations I have with Andrews and other people who engage with Math for Wisdom have been very, very um, useful for me. And uh, so in becoming a Patreon supporter, I hope to continue uh, these conversations and to be able to create a base of support for Andrus and uh, possibly some of the other contributors of uh, some of the other contributors to math and wisdom, so that these conversations can continue going forward because it's a way of engaging with people with different points of view and um, kind of um, getting outside your own echo chamber. So the again, these conversations have been very useful for me and that's why i support i'm a patreon supporter of math for wisdom